Salvation in Christ is absolutely and eternally the only way to keep from going to a very real hell. A place that is so awful it's called eternal death or more accurately the place of eternal dying. And as a follower of Jesus Christ we ought to be really relieved and really happy that we're not going there. I, I mean, we should shout, woohoo! Can I get a woohoo? <laughs> yeah. Amen, right? Uh, but many times we could be accused of only preaching fire and brimstone and hell and damnation. Some could accuse us of saying that's all that Christianity is about insurance from hell. Rob Bell, in his book Love Wins, says that a loving God would never send people to such an awful place. That is heresy. Others may admit that there is a literal hell and say they are glad that they are not going there, but that this Christianity thing is such a drag it's all do's and don'ts, but at least they're not going to hell. Listen, beloved, for us to warn people about a burning, stinking hell and a place of eternal dying is not only right, it's not only a sensible warning, but it is a loving thing to do because it happens to be true. There is a literal hell. And we all deserve it. We all deserve a burning, stinking hell. And without Jesus Christ as our Savior, we will in fact get our just desserts. But salvation in Jesus Christ offered to men has many other very positive aspects. Most positive at all of all is our eternal home in heaven. Um, Sue and Missy wanted me very much to emphasize that truth during Ron's celebration of life, that we have a home in heaven. It's our Father's house. And certainly that is the greatest of all the positive aspects of our salvation. However, in Hebrews, the Holy Spirit is shouting out through the writer that there is another positive aspect of salvation that impacts our life right here, right now. And that positive aspect of salvation is that life with Jesus Christ is not simply fire insurance. Life with Jesus Christ is better than any other way you can live. Life goes better with Jesus. So as we return to Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through chapter 5 verse 10, we're focusing on one of these great positive aspects of our salvation. That Life is better with Jesus Christ. And in this text, one of the wonderful blessings that we have, and it's in present tense, Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Now last week we saw that the writer begins in verses uh, 14 through 16 of chapter 4 to give us two applications based on that precious truth. He says there are certain challenges or certain applications by way of command that since Jesus Christ is our high priest we have these two applications. The first is you must have a continual profession. Verse 14 says let us hold fast our confession. Now, well, times are tough and we're not only seeing the results of a physical storm from last Monday night but there is a moral, spiritual, political, civil storm going right on right now. Um, 
I, I won't go off on a tangent, but I believe our, our presidential election is, is a clear choice for me because I only vote for pro-life candidates. But I think there's also the difference between conservative and liberal, between what we hold dear, most of us as Americans, and a socialistic agenda, uh, and I'll stop there. Uh, but there's a big, big storm in our country, right? Uh, we see that. Um, if anything should be apparent to us is that we're living in very troubling times in our, our nation, in our families, in our church. And like Paul, we would say that if we have hope only in this life, we are most miserable. If all we have is the hope that we have in this life, then I think we're in a bundle of hurts. But no matter how hard things go, and how hard they're going right now, I have a high priest, Jesus Christ our Lord, that is ministering for me. And I'll be so bold I would not mind seeing my great high priest in person before I elect my next president. <laughs> I would be fine with that. Amen? But no matter how things are going, the application, first application to the fact that Jesus Christ is our high priest is don't give up. Hold fast to your profession. Hold fast. Second application is you have a continual presentation. You have a continual profession. You have a continual presentation. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus is our great high priest and he's here to take us to the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace in our time of need. Right now. That is not a promise of just not going to hell. That is a very good promise, a very great truth, and the result of our precious salvation. However, being a devoted follower of Jesus Christ means that no matter what you're going through right now, you can freely and personally go into the presence of God the Father for help. We live in a country that doesn't quake in fear before our president or a king. And that's a good thing, I think, although certainly I think there is a need for us in our country to show more reverence for our leaders, uh, elected leaders, our police, even, even pastor teachers. Uh, I think there's a need to show reverence. But we don't live in fear of appearing before any of them. I would not be afraid to stand in the presence of Donald Trump, would you? He's our president. I would be honored to do that. Uh, I'm usually not afraid to stand in the presence of police unless I'm speedy, <laughs> you know. Uh, we were at a restaurant and there was a group of men a policeman having lunch and I walked over and said thank you guys for your service. I had no fear going over before them. Uh, you remember the story of Esther? Esther in order to save her people wanted needed to appear before the king unannounced and uninvited. In that culture if you did that you could be easily put to death. And that is why Esther says that great line, I need to do this, and if I perish, I perish. She trusted God. And God delivered. But we don't have that fear. And that's a good thing. And the reason we don't have that fear of going before the king of the universe is because we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, that has opened up heaven to us. He is the Pontifex Maximus, the greatest 
of all high priests. Now those are the two great applications of this blessed truth that Jesus is our high priest. And as I said last week, the Holy Spirit then takes the next big section of Hebrews from chapter 5 to chapter 10 to talk about this whole ministry of the great high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. He's better than Aaron. He's better than any pope. He's better than any cult leader. He is better than any pastor or under shepherd. Jesus Christ and he alone is our great high priest. So the writer, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, moves from the challenges, the applications, to consider the great truths of Jesus Christ as our great high priest. And he begins in chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, just giving us some very basic characteristics of what a high priest is. So certain characteristics must be made. Um, certain ca characteristics must be met. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 5 verses 1 through 4. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, uh, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself but only when called by God just as Aaron was. Uh, in these first four verses the qualification for a priest are standard Jewish qualifications. He's reminding them now and he says these are the qualifications of a priest and then in verses 5 through 9 he's going to say this is how Jesus meets those qualifications. Uh, uh, this is a very important way to begin our study of Jesus as high priest. Uh, there are some ways Jesus didn't fit the qualifications for a priest as far as the nation Israel. He was not part of the right tribe. He did not go to school to be a priest. He apparently did not spend all of his life preparing for that. There's no indication in any way that Jesus was fit to meet some of those human qualifications for being a priest. So it's very important that the writer says, here are the qualifications that matter and Jesus meets those. Do you understand the argument now? That's what we're looking at. So the Holy Spirit, through the writer, states not only that Jesus is the high priest, but he's going to move through his qualifications and his functions as a high priest. But the very first important qualification is the high priest was to be selected by God from among men. In verse 1, for every high priest taken from among men is chosen or ordained from men. Every high priest taken from man is chosen by God. So he must be taken from man. And then verse 4, and no man takes this honor to himself, but only when he is called by God, just as was Aaron. The high priest is selected by God. Aaron's the good illustration of that. A tribe priest had to be taken from among men. He had to be a man. He had to minister for men. And, and verse 1, he had to be chosen. The Old Testament priests were chosen by God. Uh, if you go back to Exodus 28, and don't do that, I'll read it for you. Verse 1, And take you unto yourself, Aaron your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. Aaron's son. God's talking directly to Moses here and he's very pointed, very direct and says, here's the guys I want you to have as priests. He chooses Aaron and, and, and his sons. And, and you will remember that anybody who took and did not minister the way that God said and were not called by God to minister 
the result was their death. And that's what happened to Korah, Dathan, uh, Abram. Uh, they ministered in an improper way and God took their life. Verse 1 says, every high priest taken from among men. God chooses from among men in the Old Testament economy. And, and the priest then was a partaker of the nature of the people he officiates for. God didn't choose angels to be priests. He didn't choose animals to be priests. Angels could never identify with us as far as having a human nature. Animals obviously could not communicate for us. So God chose from among men so that experientially the priest would know what it was like to be a man. Now, remember to who the Hebrews is, the book of Hebrews is written. It's written to Jewish believers and they were having a hard time understanding this whole idea of the incarnation. Jesus Christ being God man. In fact, how could God die? Uh, that was a, a stumbling point for them. And, and uh, why would the Messiah have to die? They were having a hard time getting a grip on that, that Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. And here the Holy Spirit answers that one reason that is true is because Jesus had to become man or he could never be the great high priest. He had to be chosen from among men. And, and unless God in Jesus feels what you and I feel, what we go through, then he has no basis experientially to operate as a sympathetic high priest. But God did not keep himself aloof. God did not station himself in a corner of heaven. He sent Jesus so he could be our sympathetic high priest. John Calvin said, It was necessary for Christ to become a real man. For as we are very far from God, we stand in a manner before him in the person of our priests, which could not be were he not one of us. Hence, that the Son of God has a nature in common with us does not diminish his dignity, and I might add his deity, but commends it the more to us, for he is fitted to reconcile us to God because he is man. Interesting word uh, in verse 1. It says, every high priest taken from among men is ordained or appointed by God. The appointer is God. Uh, verse 4, no one takes this honor for himself. God called the high priest directly. There is a very important and a very practical application right now for First Baptist of Mentone. God, beloved, is still in the business of calling his leaders. As deacons act and suggest a candidate for you to consider for this precious office of pastor, the most basic question that that candidate must answer, this is first, he must answer the question, have you been called by God? That's, that's the utmost important question. In my ordination, one of the examiners, fellow pastor, asked me this. What if we recommend to this church that they do not ordain you? What will you do? My answer was, well, I will want to know what I need to do so that you and the church will recognize the call of God upon my life. And he said, as a follow-up question, then you believe that this ordination is not your call, that you are called by God. In a humble boldness, I say this. Yes, I am. Do you understand? You have to be called by God. And without the call of God, I want to be honest, 
most of us pastors would quit. <laughs> it's tough being a pastor. Now it's tough being whatever you are. Uh, Todd was just recognized for his faithfulness as insurance. Not always easy being an insurance agent, I'm sure. Uh, uh, sometimes he would probably want to crawl away from being an insurance agent. And there are times when you, as a pastor, say, I've had it. Uh, Every Monday. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, but, but the fact of the matter, what keeps me going, what has kept me going through all the trials and tribulations and accusations and so on, is that men did not call me, God did. And you got to recognize that the high priest was to be called by God, not by men. No one chooses this office. I never chose to be a pastor. I wanted to be anything but a pastor. Uh, I didn't want to be a mortician. I didn't want to be a pastor. They both deal with the dead. Uh, but, you know, I just didn't want to do it. But God called me. And, and God calls his leaders today. Amen? Not only that, not only is he selected by God, he must be sympathetic with men. Verse 2. Uh, um, God says, he can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward because he himself is beset with weakness. Uh, weakness refers to our hu human nature uh, that makes temptation a real issue. A true high priest sympathizes on that basis with us. A person who is non-compassionate could care less about anybody else's pain. But the priest, the, the true leader of God, must come from among men and he must be able to bear gently. And that's what the word means. It means to have sympathy, to bear gently, uh, to be completely involved in human situation. He's bound up in the bundle of life. He must experience life with the people he ministers. He must enjoy when they enjoy. He must weep when they weep. He must be there with their highs. He must be there with their lows. He must bear gently because he feels it like they feel it. That's a long translation of that one word, bear, but that's the implication. And, and the emphasis here is sympathy. The Jewish priest was a sinner, and he had the natural capacity and the moral capacity to feel what others were feeling because he's been there. The high priest was selected by God, and he was to be sympathetic with men. And a third characteristic in verse 1 again, he offers sacrifice for sin. Verse 3 is essentially saying the same thing. The priest offered sacrifices and gifts for the sins on behalf of men. He was ordained for men in the things pertaining to God. That is, he was to bring men into the presence of God. He was to act on their behalf of the things that open up heaven to man open up the way to God. And verse 1 says he's to offer gifts and sacrifices. That was the main work of the priest. His work was a work of offering gift and sacrifices for sin. And later on in chapter 8 and 9, the Holy Spirit will come back to this idea of gift and sacrifices. Uh, and we'll look at that in more detail. But the most important aspect was the blood sacrifice for sin. That was the main work of the great high priest. And he had to bring the offering, the, the blood. And that was a sin offering and a trespass offering. And in verse 3, notice he had to do this for himself first. He had to go into the Holy of Holies, offer, there was a whole system, a whole rigmarole that the high priest had to do first before he offered sacrifices for his people. Uh, sacrificing for men included sacrificing for himself. He had to take care of his own sin before he sacrificed for their sin. So those are the three incredible um, characteristics that the Holy Spirit chooses to focus on 
as far as what makes a high priest. Now in verses 5 through 10, he says, I want you to see that these are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a certain conclusion to be modeled. And we're only going to scratch the surface because again, all of these things are going to be expanded from chapter 5 through chapter 10. So today is just kind of um, scratching the surface of these awesome truths. Uh, first of all, Jesus was selected by God. Verse 5, so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest. Jesus did not exalt himself. Verse 5 says, and then look at, uh, at verse 6. As he says in another place, for you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, the Holy Spirit, through the writer of Hebrews, says that God called Jesus to be high priest. That's the first qualification. He was called by God from among men. And so Jesus fits this chief requirement. He'd been called and appointed by God. He did not lay aside his deity. He did lay aside the worship and honor and the use of his deity. But he was the high priest. He didn't come to glorify himself at all. In fact, in John 8, 54, Jesus says this, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me. Jesus did not seek his own glory. The Bible says he made himself of no reputation. He didn't seek glory. And then Paul reminds us that after his resurrection and ascension, God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name. So God glorifies the Son. God invested in Jesus the authority and honor of the high priest. And he says right here, uh, uh, you know, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. You are a priest forever. In Psalms he talks about I'll give, a, there'll be a day when all your enemies bow down before you. He is our great high priest. And so he fits the first requirement. Now you'll notice the writer says he is that God has called him a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Well, in chapter 7, we get into a lot more detail, so I'm not going to spend hardly any time on the order of Melchizedek, but I will give you a little preview. Um, what did it mean to be a, a priest after the order of Melchizedek? Well, there's a lot of things, but in Psalm 110, uh, which is a messianic psalm and talks about being a priest of Melchizedek, the priest is also a king. Aaron was a priest, but never a king. Jesus Christ is not only our high priest, but he is also a king. And he is the king of the universe. And, and that is just one of the great examples or um, results of being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He is priest king. And, and you're going to be so blessed when we get into that study. It's just so rich. Uh, but right now, uh, Jesus Christ fits the first qualification of a high priest. He is selected by God from a man from among men. And second, he is sympathetic towards men. Was Jesus sympathetic? Did he feel what they feel? Uh, look at verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverential fear. Uh, what a loaded statement that verse is theologically. We could camp here for days and focus on just that verse and all that it means. We will not do that. Again, we're just scratching the surface. But here's what it means. Jesus was on this planet for 33 years. And here the Holy Spirit says that when he was on this planet, he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears for God to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverential fear. Uh, Jesus went through it. He went through it all. And, and with tears and 
prayers and supplication. He spent time on this planet feeling what we feel. He existed in eternity past. He exists in eternity future. But for 33 years, he was God in flesh with us. And Paul said to Timothy, who was having some physical problems, and God, Paul gave him some practical advice. But then he said this, Remember Jesus Christ, born of the seed of David. Uh, Timothy, you're suffering. But remember, Jesus also was a man. And then he said these words, and remember, he was risen from the dead. <laughs> Timothy, Jesus suffered and he conquered it. Just remember that. He's one of us. And, and you've got the resurrection power, Timothy, of Christ you can claim. And that's all you need. I mean, if we're sick, we are going to get better one way or the other, right? Ron is better. The best he could be. Why? Because of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. So if I get sick, I'm in good hands. I, I'm concerned for my dear wife, but she's in good hands. And I don't mean simply the doctors. Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And he feels what we have feel, what we feel. And the climax comes, he offers prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears. Does that remind you of Gethsemane? Sure. Uh, that was the greatest claim or, and the greatest climax of his suffering in prayer. He began to feel the crush of sin upon him. He began to feel the bruising of Satan. And listen, you and I cannot understand what it means to be sinless and to become sin. But that's what Jesus did. And the gospel tells us the agony of Jesus Christ at that point was so great that he sweat as it were great drops of blood as he prayed. Jesus knows what it is to be in anguish and to pray with a forced utterance of prayer. And that's what the word cry means. It's a forced utterance of prayer. He knows what it's like to hurt so bad that he has to say, Ah! You understand? And the point the Spirit is making is that Jesus is qualified to be a sympathetic high priest because of his agony, agony, because of his tears, because of his prayers, because of his suffering. In fact, verse 8 says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through suffering. Um, that's kind of a mystery to me. As a father, I try to keep my kids and my grandkids from experiencing pain. Don't touch that. You will get burnt. And, and I, I try to keep them from pain. But they will do just like I do. Sometimes you got to play with fire yourself and then you realize you got burnt, right? Uh, we learn through suffering. And why I do not understand all of this, even though he was God's son, Jesus didn't know what suffering was until he came to this earth. Do you understand? He experienced suffering and he did that for you and me so he could be our sympathetic high priest. Sympathy comes from experience and Jesus learned suffering and obedience to God through the suffering of pain. Now notice, that's the kind of priest I want. I, I don't want a priest who's way out there in the boondocks of eternity sitting on a little ivory throne towering over the universe and not knowing how I feel. When I pray, Jesus says, I know Mike, I've been there. But you don't understand what it's like to have your friends turn their back on you. Yeah, I do. Do you remember Judas kissed me? Do you understand we have a high priest that is sympathetic with us because he's been through it for us? 
And then the most glorious aspect of all, he offers sacrifice for sin. Notice he pray in our English Bible, it says, to him who is able to save him from death. In the Greek, that preposition means out of, not from. Jesus wasn't praying, God, please don't let me die. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples, my hour has come. This is what I came to do, to give my life a ransom for many. I appreciate it, Ron and Bab's song so much. We are redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. Uh, did I say right, Ron and Bab? I didn't say right. Gary and Bab. <laughs> I was thinking, I got Bev wrong. I got Ron wrong. Uh, Gary wrong. Uh, don't know why I said that, Gary. I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me? Uh, Gary and Bev. Um, redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb, right? But Jesus didn't pray, God, don't let me die. He was not fearful of dying. Gethsemane was not about dying. It was about becoming sin. And we don't understand that. But Jesus says, for this hour I came into the world. Our text says, he's praying to him who is able to save him out of death. Jesus is saying, I want you to give me victory over death. That's what he's praying about. And did God answer that prayer? Absolutely. He raised him from the dead. He came to die for us, a ransom from our sin, a ransom for our sin. But he was praying that he, through the anguish, the agony, and all that of becoming sin for you and me, he was saying, God, please get me out from under the power of death and hell and the grave. And the scripture says, and God heard him. He was heard because of his reverence for the Father. Simple statement. Jesus Christ was heard. He, he has become, in verse 9, he then has become the author and source of eternal salvation. By his death, he opened the way. He's the author of salvation. All the priests of all other time could not provide eternal salvation. They provided momentarily, momentary forgiveness. It had to be repeated daily and yearly. But Jesus Christ, by one act, by offering his life, his perfect sacrifice, he has forever become the author, the cause, the originator of eternal salvation. Because he is our great high priest. He didn't have to offer anything for himself because he's the sinless son of God. Now notice... That this whole salvation thing, the Holy Spirit says at the end of verse 9, this is for all who obey him. Now, what does it mean to obey him? Beloved, that's not talking about obeying the Ten Commandments. Romans 10, 16 says this, For they have not all obeyed the gospel. Not all have obeyed the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians 1.8, In flaming fire, God will take vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says to the Thessalonians and Paul says to the Romans, you have to obey the gospel. That's what gets us saved, is obeying the gospel. It doesn't mean keeping a list of rules. It means to obey God's command, to believe on his provision, the gospel of Jesus Christ, who gave his life on the cross. He sacrificed himself, shed his blood on that altar so that you and I can be saved. And we must obey the gospel. Friend, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your great high priest? Do you believe you need no other high priest? You need no other offering to stand between you and God. If you obey the gospel, that is all God asks of you to be saved. 
It is the obedience of faith made possible by Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Oh, what a great high priest we have. He is selected by God. He is sympathetic towards us. And he, and he alone, is the perfect sacrifice for our sin. Jesus Christ is perfectly qualified. Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this time together focusing on the person of Jesus Christ and on his priesthood. Right now, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would capture our hearts and our emotions and our will. It might be activated from what we've learned. Father, we're asking humbly that no one would go from this place who has not committed himself to Jesus Christ. We're asking that no one watching this online would not be saved. We're asking all that have heard this gospel would obey the word of the gospel and in faith embrace Jesus Christ. Through this end, we pray that Christ as our great high priest, to each and every one of us who have heard this, that we might respond in obedience of faith. And we pray this in the name of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, the Son of God.